Uh, well, I mean, maybe maybe I don't need to share a screen. Uh, if if I look okay, if I look sharp enough, uh, we'll see. Uh, like, uh, 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 I, I the one thing I've learned in my life is big fonts. Uh, uh, so, uh, all right. So, what machine wants? What machines want uh, is a, a provocative title that I enjoyed quite a bit. I kept wanting to stick on a subtitle, uh, something like, you know, how bottom-up engineering will solve all our problems or something like that. Uh, but then it, it just was so much punchier uh, without a subtitle, so I stuck with it. And I think that actually it connects just to what uh, Manfred was saying at the very end that just moments ago about... It's not about necessarily about our knowledge, but about how we're going to transmit it, how we're going to exchange it. And we need to be thinking much more, much as I hate to say it, I, it's, this has been a bitter pill for me. Uh, uh, we have to be thinking much more like Madison Avenue, much more like jingles and advertisements uh, uh, to make the points true. Uh, sitting down and explaining carefully like a teacher uh, you know, uh, uh, putting it in some fun way and saying, by the way, you might profit. Uh, now, that's the way to get something done. So, I am going to answer the question, uh, what machines want. Um, machines want space, materials, power, and time. Okay, that's it. Uh, so, now we can have discussion. Uh, um, uh, you know, okay. Yeah, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to drill. I mean, a lot of what I want to say is crashingly obvious, and yet I feel there are some non-obvious conclusions from all this obvious stuff that says to me someone needs to say the obvious out loud. Uh, so, so that's what I'm trying to do here. Uh, uh, so I'll drill into each of the each of these in a, in a minute. Uh, okay, so I wrote this down using emergent engineering for integrating complex systems to achieve an equitable society. Okay. Equitable society. I like that. I want to work for that. I don't know, and I've been listening for a day now to what emergent engineering is, uh, um, and kind of the, the best I can come up with, really, is, I mean, I have a problem with the word emergent in general, uh, uh, because to me, uh, saying something is emergent kind of implies it's over there. You know, it's emerging from over there like that. And, ooh, uh, it, you know, uh, it surprised us. You know, presto changeo, emergence, uh, uh, like that. And uh, I don't feel that that's the way I want to do it. If I'm going to try to get deep inside physical systems, if I'm going to get deep inside manufactured systems and uh, try to understand them on their own terms, really, then I'm going to be over there. It's not going to emerge. It's going to be engineered. It's the, <laughs> the other side of it. Uh, uh, so we'll see. Uh, but certainly uh, keeping the goal in mind of getting to a more equitable society, uh, absolutely. Okay, let's drill into it. Um, so what I have been working on for about the last uh, a decade or more uh, uh, is called the T2 Tile Project. And my goal is to build a whole new computational stack to demonstrate other ways to compute. Uh, a lot of folks who I've spoken to, especially folks coming from other disciplines than computation, tend to have a very narrow view of computation, like CPU and RAM and deterministic execution. That's what computation is. And, you know, that's partly computer science's fault. <laughs> computer science has gone and said that sort of thing, that if you don't have, uh, you know, step-by-step, -step, one thing at a time, if it's not guaranteed 100% reliable, it's not computation at all. But that's a completely unsatisfactory characterization of computation. It's far too narrow. There's so many more things beyond CPU and RAM. And so uh, the questions I addressed was, well, if, it's, if the architecture of computation is not going to be CPU and RAM, what is it going to be? What should we be going for if it's not a faster CPU and a bigger RAM? And the suggestion is we should be going for indefinitely scalable systems. And so the way you build an indefinitely scalable computational system 
room is you do settle on a tile. And, and this is the tile that I settled on called, I call it the T2 tile. It's got a tiny little Linux box inside and it connects to others of its own kind uh, in any of six sides. So you can build this uh, two-dimensional wall of these things. And in fact, we have a wall that I'll show a little example in a minute. Uh, uh, these things are not deterministic. These, there's no overall synchronization among these things. They race with each other. Some of them, you know, will reboot while the rest of the system doesn't. And the software is supposed to deal with all of that. So if not CPU and RAM, what? Pick a model that we can grow arbitrarily and understand the properties of that. And that's what the T2 tile project is doing. And again, if we don't have deterministic execution, because my claim is, is deterministic execution is a property of small systems. And so if you're going to say seriously anything about scaling, you have to be ready to move beyond deterministic execution. You're going to have to say what happens in failures, simple and complex. And the fact that we don't say that is one of the poster child children for why we have unintended consequences. And it happens over and over and over and it gets incredibly old uh, when we're looking at it from a bottom up. We build the system to be robust first and we'll take out a whole huge category of unintended consequences. There'll be plenty more. If not top-down control, well, then what? And the answer I'm going to give is uh, the idea of delegating agency, that we're going to say, you, the, the component of this system, you are going to get to take care of this little bit of space, this little bit of time, this little bit of energy. That's yours. Keep it clean. Keep your desk clean. Try to be ready. Help out the neighbors if you can. And we're not going to worry about it anymore. That's how we're going to get past the idea of traditional engineering that's trying to control all the elements of the system. They're trying not to delegate any agency and hold it all at the top, which is, again, fine for small systems and a disaster for systems at scale. And so a lot of what's going on in our world is that we have these disastrous, stupid models that don't work at the scale we're applying them, and therefore they are getting exploited for money by people who get it, uh, uh, and the rest of us are getting uh, the hoodwinks pulled over our eyes. Uh, um, and so what I want to do now, yikes, is show a, a little clip for a couple of minutes of the kinds of things uh, we've been building over the years with the T2 tiles to get a little bit of the flavor. Uh, um, so, you know, these tiles have no synchronization. So even to get them to do something like turn off, that requires all kinds of communication and scheduling. And you see in a second how this turns off. It doesn't go bloop. Everything is operating on its own. There's no strict step-by-step, -step, uh, um, and sometimes it doesn't. So we've got uh, a cellular automata where the edge of the cellular automata is some kind of completely irregular shape, and in fact, it may change while the computation is running. So this is a called splits at the end of the universe. It's a particle that just goes until there's nothing there, and then it makes two of them, and off it goes. And over the years, uh, started doing experiments trying to build systems that would make small structured scale, spatially structured systems. There's no absolute coordinates here. There's no zero, zero, one, two, none of that. Uh, um, and yet we start to build these things. And so the idea of doing these plates, little 2D things, is let's make a finite synchronization zone, a little zone that we're going to say here, we have a, a XY coordinate within the plate, but not between the plates. And then we can have these things go. So now we actually have sort of a developmental program, make the right eye, make the mouth, make the left eye, which is kind of a stupid way to do it, but what the hell, uh, uh, and so on. Now, I'm including this one. This is another version of splits at the end of the universe that we saw a minute ago. It's a color one, but this happens. And this is a serious bug in the event processing engine uh, uh, that's running under this thing. This is I, I learned of it. And what amazes me, and this goes on for a long time, is that the system actually recovered from it, even though the individual cells were crashing all over the place and trying to restart. And now finally, sort of to wrap up, uh, taking the idea of, again, a, a local coordinate space, and in this case, it's a diamond, so it's like Manhattan distance of a circle, 
and de develop ways for them to move and sense until I could make this. I could make a, I want to say, living cell. It, it's got a cell membrane. It's got these kind of like cilia that serve to give sensors so that the cell can get earlier warning about when it's running into something because it takes a long time for the information to get from the edge to the center. And that's where it has to make the decision on which way to go. Ah, um, and now we've got these things. This is actually a, a program for a two cell creature that forms a forward slash made out of two cells and addition yeah, and you can see them. You can see it forming there, uh, uh, as well as spinning off an extra cell, so that eventually it'll fill the space with forward slashes, if all goes well. And none of this is a none of this happens the same way every time. Uh, uh, getting this to happen it was a big deal. It's not easy. And the last thing that we're doing this year is using the uh, the the T2 tile matrix uh, as a controller for a simulated vehicle. Uh, uh, so here it's uh, assigned the job of getting rid of all the yellow balls, uh, uh, and it, it does that with great uh, exuberance. Uh, um, and uh, the uh, uh, that's it. Okay, great. Uh, um, so, what that says to me uh, uh, in my nine remaining minutes uh, um, is scaling is not a single activity. It's not like you have N and you just increase N and then something magic happens in the world. That's not scaling or, or that's a, a very naive notion of scaling. And what we actually need is to have scaling that creates structure at all scales. So when we have, so a, one of these tiles, for example, consists of about, you know, 500 individual little cellular automata sites. It's a collection. Each cellular automata site consists of 96 bits. Each tile connects to dozen, uh, six other tiles and so forth. Um, Structure at all scales, rather than the naive idea, the Facebook idea, the idea of every internet play, that we will control everything from the center, uh, uh, which is, again, the traditional engineering approach uh, um, and the approach that is a disaster. Okay? All right. Uh, uh, so, quickly, uh, machines want space, material, power, and time. Machines want space. What does that mean to me? Well, for one thing, it means a machine would rather be, you know, like compact. It would rather actually, you know, fit all inside a square yard or a cubic yard or something like that, a sewing machine in a box, uh, rather than have a piece here, a piece there, a piece all over the place and so on. Uh, uh, machines want space. So, uh, mise en place, uh, right? That uh, The way that a machine is happy when everything it needs is right where it is, close by, so everything can be grabbed and so forth. The deep, deep point is the first one. Machines want a stake in the universe. Machines have to exist. Yeah, uh, that's their purpose. They can't do anything if they're just an idea. They can't, they can't do anything if they're just words. The words have to be executed by something, and that something has to exist in the physical universe. And so we are these weird programmable machines. People are programmable machines. That seems pretty unarguable. To me, there's many ways that we can look at people, but one of them is, you know, on the one hand, we've got this meat, and on the other hand, we've got all this language uh, uh, that can change our behavior. And so when we talk about, uh, as, as, as Manfred did and as uh, Jeff did, talking about the difference between social and physical, the difference between traditional engineering and maybe emergent engineering, I think the clearest way to express that is talking about hardware versus talking about software. Uh, uh, and the reason, the, the, it's important to understand that software is physical too. Uh, software takes up space. Software sits in memory, sits on a disk, sits in a flash drive. And when it's, it's software is in some spot, nothing else can be stored there. So it's not a matter of being physical or not physical. 
It's all physical. The difference is, is that code is so cheap to move. It's so cheap to copy that we get completely different statistics in what we look at out in the world. Uh, when something can be motivated by code, boom, that's what it means, can go viral, you know, that kind of thing. Now, of course, viral is actually carrying physical matter, but that's optimized the thing down so the whole thing is about as big as it needs to be the code, and, uh, and therefore it, it's a, a touch point between the physical and the social. So. A machine wants space because it has to exist in the universe. And when we are being abstract, like the laws of physics, the laws of physics do not care where you are. That's their signal characteristic. That's the whole thing. We're trying to find out the stuff that doesn't matter where you are. This is stuff that's true everywhere. Physical law is isotropic uh, uh, like that which is great, which is wonderful, but that means it doesn't address the reality of having a stake in the universe and wanting to preserve your stake in the universe. That's what we have to be aware of. So, machines want materials. Now, material is not the same as matter, and this is what uh, uh, Nicholas was talking about yesterday, about blueprints. Uh, because a material is matter plus code. It's matter plus warranty, matter plus a name, matter plus implicit fitness for purpose, whatever it is. And in fact, building machinery based on a blueprint, which is based on a program, a blueprint is a program, all machines are this parallel walk of physical stuff and code stuff. And if the material, and just as he talked about, just as he talked about, we have to melt the aluminum all the way down to bare aluminum and cast it back up again so that we can make a sheet that will pass for aluminum new. And th the question yesterday was, is there a way that we could uh, uh, reuse at higher level? And the answer is, sure, uh, uh, if we had structure at a higher level. For example, if we built everything out of Legos, then we could just break them down into Legos and then build them back up. We don't have to go all the way down to plastic, to, to butyrene, uh, uh, and so on. Okay. Machines want power. Okay. Uh, the, the important point is that, uh, you know, machines, uh, require a source of power because machines do actual work. Even if that actual work is just lighting up an LED or pushing one bit through a wire or whatever it happens to be, that's still work in the physical sense. It still takes energy. And so we have to have that all hooked up. Machine won't run without power. That machines want time. That's the fourth and final thing that a machine wants. And it wants time because it takes time to do all of this stuff. It takes time to do construction. It takes time to do operation and so forth. Okay, I'm almost out of time. Now, as a second order effect, after we've understood, yeah, machines want uh, uh, space and time, they want materials and power, um, what machines also want, uh, uh, machines want work, machines want profit, they want stability, and they want allies. Uh, um, and, you know, this is pretty clear, right? Because how is a machine going to stay in the world if it's not turning a profit? How is it going to pay for its, oil, you know, oil jobs and so on and so forth? Uh, um, and... Machines need to connect to other machines. That's how we get compositionality. That's how we build bigger machines out of smaller machines. We make contracts. We make allies. And just like a contract, you know, literal East Coast code, you know, the, the code of the legal system describing the obligations of a contract, uh, um, there's exactly the same sort of thing going on where there's a physical relationship about I give you money and you give me aluminum, uh, uh, and then there's a contractual relationship that goes with them, and both of that is necessary for the system to turn the crank and for it to all work and produce a, a new machine, whatever it's supposed to do, uh, uh, like that. So that's how we're going to scale up. We're going to scale up. We're going to build machines that want to have local agency. They have space that they control. I have this space right here. This is all mine. I will defend that. 
if you try to get in here. And in fact, what Chris was talking about, about the deliberative democracy stuff, what's different about actually gathering in a room and, and having quiet discussions versus, you know, uh, being here like I am on the Internet? And, you know, one difference is in one case you're in punching distance and the other case you're not. Uh, uh, and that is just another example of the primacy of space. And so I want to I want to end by saying we're trying to build uh, new abstractions here that do not start by throwing away space. So traditional physics starts by throwing away space and saying we're we're only interested in stuff that's true everywhere. And, and instead, the engineering is to say we are interested in stuff that's actually situated in some particular place, and it makes these kind of relationships with its spatially close neighbors, and it makes those kind of relationships, and so on and so forth. Um, once we get beyond determinism, what does it mean to make allies? What does it mean to make contracts? And in the bigger picture, it's not, you know, it's not, uh, you know, small talk with messages and responses. Well, it is kind of, but it's so fluid. It's so flexible. It's so non-deterministic that, uh, you know, phase lock loops in, in electrical circuits are absolutely basic thing, essential for communication, so all kinds of things, clocks, you name it. Uh, uh, I want to say there is a obvious generalization of phase lock loops to much more complicated systems like us having a conversation back and forth, taking turns, uh, uh, sending text messages, whatever that is. That is a phase lock loop in a distributed system that we have just fallen into and created for the purpose of communicating about dinner or whatever it happens to be. Okay, I'm over my time, so uh, I'll stop there. I, <laughs> I hope some of this was interesting. Thanks anyway. Mm -hmm.